All right, well, hello, church. Let's pray together. Let's uh, lift our voices, our hearts, our lives to the Lord one more time in prayer. Father, we love you. We're so grateful to have your word, to be able to gather as a family and to celebrate you. So grateful that you have redeemed our lives. Grateful that you have uh, given us your mercy today, fresh and new. And we pray now as we open your word that you would teach us, that you would guide us, you would direct our lives, that we would have the spiritual eyes to see the possibilities and opportunities that you have for us as we move forward in following you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Man, it's good to be with you today. And uh, we're going to... We're going to conclude a series titled New. And if you're joining us uh, online today or any of our other campuses, we are so grateful that you're with us. And uh, we look forward to celebrating Jesus as a family today from multiple places. And as we enter into this, this last week of the new series, I want to give you a, a little bit of a recap. If you look with me at this scripture, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. I know it's uh, something we've repeated multiple times, but but we sure are glad that the old has been removed from our life and that something new has come. And the way we've best been able to articulate that and understand it together as a family is that we moved out of our unrighteousness and into the righteousness of Jesus, which was pure gift. It's not something we did. It's not something we earned. It's not something we thought of. It's not something we accomplished through our own willpower. It's something God did in us. And we've been, we've been walking through the idea of if that is true, then what other invitations has God given to us to align the belief that that's true with our behavior? And we've talked about this idea that, you know, if we want to experience and mature in our faith, then we must be proactive, not to, not to earn that newness, but to show it. Not to achieve it on our own strength, but to say, God has invited us to be proactive, right? God's invited us to do some things that, that maybe we would um, intuitively not move towards because <laughs> it's easy just to kind of settle. It's easy to be complacent sometimes. Sometimes laziness acts like your best friend, but it's not. And God says, hey, there are some things you can do. So what have we talked about? We talked about studying and applying God's word, how unapplied truth is really worthless. You have to learn how to apply it. There's all kinds of instructions in God's word that are not meant to measure his love for you. They're meant to endear you to him and to show you that he has a better way of life. But you never know it unless you apply it. We talked about prayer and fasting. We spent time doing that corporately as a family and the reason for that and battling through some things that are unseen, the spiritual battle that goes on. We talked about how to manage our money and our possessions, the things that we own, and why it's important to not just compartmentalize the physical things we own separate from God, but to see them as a tool to fulfill the will that he has for our lives and to bring fulfillment to us. We looked at as well, friendship, relationship, it's either intentionally or unintentionally happening. It should be intentionally happening, but some of us have drifted into relationship that actually feels good on the surface, but might be actually toxic for us. If we don't have the right circle of people around us to expose our blind spots, to help us, to hold us accountable, to say, I'm going to take into account what you're capable of, and I'm going to come and support you where you are struggling, where you're lacking, where you need borrowed strength. I'm going to celebrate with you when we see God doing a work in your life. You need that kind of relationship. It, these are all the things we've been studying through, walking through. Last week, we, we kind of rounded it all out with talking about how to serve. Use the spiritual gifts that God has given you to participate in what he's doing. That you might have some clarity, some perspective about the miracles he's unfolding in people's lives that no one else has except for those who serve. And, and we talked through all of that. Today, I wanna, I wanna do something um, a little different and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears with you. 
And um, this has all been about proactiveness. This has all been about what can I say yes to God in my life re related to my behavior to experience more of that new that he has for me? What can, I, what can I do to cooperate with God in this new life that he's formed on my behalf? And today I wanna, I wanna shift gears. I wanna talk to you about reactiveness a little bit because I think it's pretty apparent that we all know that many of the days of your life, you get to choose how to approach it how to make it better, how to say yes to God. You get to choose what your day is gonna look like, but there are some days you don't get that choice. Agreed? That there's a lot of days in which you get to choose how you're gonna honor God today and how you're gonna move forward and what you're gonna do with your family. And there are some days where life seems to take over and you lose control of that and you have to respond instead of just being proactive. And I wanna to talk to you about how to react well. Before I do, I wanna read you this quote that I think kind of demonstrates or, or summarizes everything we've talked about to this point. It's from an author that I enjoy reading. Uh, his name is James Clear, and he writes this. He says, true behavior change is identity change. Identity change. When your behavior and your identity are fully aligned, you are no longer pursuing change. And the reason I wanted to, to say that, it, oh, it goes on, it says this too, you are simply acting like the type of person you already believe yourself to be. The reason I wanted to share that thought with you is that James is a researcher of social behaviors. He researches some psychology and some scientific methods that show how humans interact and how they grow and how they develop. I think it's always interesting when someone like that applies their life to help us understand kind of the internal pieces going on in us, and it actually confirms God's word. Let me show it to you, okay? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says that the old is gone, the new has come. That is not something that we're hoping for. That we believe as people of faith is reality. That's not something we're hoping God will eventually do. No, 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 we received the righteousness of Jesus the moment we surrendered our life to him and we are new. And now our behavior is not moving us towards that newness. Our behavior is actually underscoring that it's true. I think it's always fascinating when you have the world outside of the, outside of the faith aspect, outside of the church that learns through science and social behaviors and psychology and comes along and says, actually, change is a whole lot like this. It's belief and behavior aligning. And, and then you go, actually, God's the one who came up with all of that. God's the one who dictated all of that for our lives. And that's what we've been talking about, is living in a way that affirms, deepens, and matures our own understanding and is a testimony to other people. We have been saved by God. We've been saved. So today, I want to not press pause completely on that, but I do want to shift a little bit and say, now I want to talk to you about those moments where you're not really pre-deciding, you're really in the moment deciding. What do I do? And you know when you need to be reactive well is in the unexpected circumstances of life. It's in the things that you didn't see coming. It's in the things that you always knew could potentially happen that would be painful, difficult, a struggle, bring anxiety. You just didn't know when or if they would happen. And I think the reality for all of us is that, that we are all on the same playing field and it's level. Unfortunately, we can all relate to very pain-filled, unexpected, pivotal circumstances in our life. And yet there's something fortunate about that as well we learn we're not alone. We're in this together and being together is better, right? Isn't that true? And so I wanna to talk to you about this idea. How, can I ask you a question to kind of get our minds moving in the direction of how do you react well? Do you, do you ever imagine being proactively reactive? Is that even possible? <laughs> I don't know, but here's my question for you really is can you think of a time that you had 
immense pain in life. Now, I know you don't come to church to be reminded of difficult things, but today I want you to take at least a moment to think about the pain that you've endured in this life. I want you to think about maybe there was a season of incredible difficulty because of an unforeseen circumstance. Maybe there was something that happened that didn't just mark a day, but it didn't just mark a week, and it didn't just mark a month. It maybe marked a whole season of life that you've been immersed in a season of struggle and pain. Maybe it was a medical crisis. Some of you have been involved in a situation in which either you received a diagnosis or someone that you love has, and you walk through a medical crisis or maybe an immediate emergency. Maybe it was a car accident. Maybe it was, you know, somebody had, uh, you know, fallen and, and had a major injury. So I don't know what it is. Maybe you had a moment like that. It brought confusion, it brought anxiety, it brought stress and pressure. Maybe it wasn't anything to do with something medical or physical. Maybe it was the loss of a job. Maybe you get, man, I invested in my life, I, I got my degree, I, I paid for it, I, I, I stepped into my career path, I worked really hard, I got a part of this program or part of this you know, new startup and I'm working and working and everything looks good and then unexpectedly, boom, out of nowhere, it all comes to an end. In a way that some, sometimes, maybe some of you have been in a, in, a, in a transition like that, you didn't even know where it came from. You still don't. You're not in that role anymore, but you don't know where, why. Just ended abruptly. Maybe it wasn't just the loss of a job. Maybe it was, maybe it was the loss of, of you know, uh, something that you loved. Maybe you, you had an emergency or crisis and you lost something. People have lost homes. People have lost, you know, possessions that were, resourcing and providing in their life. Maybe you've lost a person, a loved one, unexpectedly. You got, you know what? At some point in our lives, we all can relate to the fact that we got that phone call in which somebody delivered incredibly horrible news, right? And you've lost somebody. Maybe you, you, you're thinking of that. Maybe it's a move. Maybe if you're a young person, I can reflect back on my childhood and remember as a teenager uh, a junior high student. I remember moving from one state to another. I remember how difficult that was. Maybe you're a student today in the room. Maybe you're, maybe you're not even a student. Maybe you're somebody who's a grown adult and, and you've gone through a transition and a move from a place that's familiar to a place that's unfamiliar and it's really difficult. Maybe it happened abruptly. Maybe it's not just that. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's a divorce in your life. Maybe there's been betrayal in your life. Maybe there's been a breakdown of you and someone who you thought would be your BFF and they're not anymore. <laughs> I don't know what the pain is, but I know that, that I've said enough things that maybe have welled up something in your mind. And the question really that, that I wanna talk to you about today is can you actually prepare in advance to be reactive in a way that brings you peace in the middle of a great storm? Can you prepare and be proactive now for something you don't even know is going to happen and posture your heart to be able to honor God even in the midst of it? Can you prepare for something that you cannot see? Is it possible? to live in preparation for reactiveness. You know what I think is true? I think that you cannot prepare everyone in your life for unexpected, difficult circumstances. I do not believe that you can prepare from a resource standpoint. I mean, I think it's good to save dollars for a rainy day, but I think there are just some things that will happen in your life you can't prepare for in the physical. What I do know is when I look to the scriptures, I find hope that you can prepare in the spiritual. I find hope that even when everything else around you can seemingly be falling apart, you can have a time of peace, you can have a time of strength, you can have a time of clarity, and we see it all through the scriptures. One of my favorite places to go to remind myself of that is the story of Job. You know, and I'll tell you this, most people know the story of Job who are not even followers of God people who are not even in relationship with the Lord. The story of Job has been a story that has made its way around the entire world. 
generation to generation, many people have heard the story of Job. Who in the world is Job, by the way? Who is that guy anyway? How'd he get in there? How did he even end up in the scriptures? Who is this guy? Well, in Job chapter one, verse one, that question's answered. I'm so glad you asked because I have an answer for one of your questions today. And it's who Job is. Are you ready? Job chapter one, verse one, it says, in the land of Uz, isn't that a cool name? The land of Uz, not the land of Ur. The land of Ur is where Abraham was from, but the land of Uz is where Job was from. Job was there and it says, lived a man whose name was Job and this man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. That's Job. Now, can I just tell you that if this is the title over Job's life, his circumstances that you're going to learn about do not fit what we often think should be the circumstances of someone who is blameless and upright. In fact, you read that and go, oh, wow, he's a good guy. I bet God really blesses his life. Well, yeah, that's actually true. But when you look into the details of his life, you go, this is a train wreck. This is, this, is, this is horrifying. If there was a horror story in the Bible, it'd be the book of Job. It's awful. It's horrible. But that's who Job is. And Job was actually a real man. Job is not a fictitious character. Job is not someone who, who is just a, some fable and some legend. He is a real person. He lived in, the, in, the, in a time that Abraham lived. He lived thousands of years ago in the land of Uz. Uz was, a, Uz was an area of the world in the Middle East adjacent to a place called Midian. Midian is where Moses lived for 40 years. Moses retreated to Midian and, um, and, and escaped some, some things out of Egypt. Well, this was in that proximity. And most scholars, popular opinion, even from the Jewish and the Christian uh, scholars, say that Moses is probably the person who informs us of the life of Job, but he predated the life of Moses and he lived in that patriarchal period of Abraham. And, and so it's a very long, long time ago. This, would, this book would have actually uh, been, uh, the, or not the book, but the experience itself would have taken place before the nation of Israel had really even been formed. And so this is, this is a long, long time. This is very early in the, in the existence of humanity. And it says that there was this man who lived upright. He lived righteously and he knew who God was and he turned his back on evil. And uh, as you enter into this story, I'm only gonna read to you from chapter one today. It's a long story. I'd encourage you to go home and read it. it won't take you that long actually um, to read the entire story of Job and get the full picture. But there's two things I do wanna point out to you at the, at the start that are thematic in the story of Job because they really help you understand what we're about to read. And the first theme in the book of Job is that, that God, is going, God is going to prove the character of believers to Satan, to demons, and to all people. So one of the things you have to understand about what, what is happening in the life of Job is that God has a end God has a goal. God has a theme in this story and in this man's life. And, and, and that theme is to show that faithfulness towards God, faithfulness towards God can actually be unbreakable in those who have the right character, who have a godly character, that faithfulness can exist even in the midst of tremendous pain. And he wants Satan to know it and he wants demons to know it, and he wants all of humanity to know it, you and I as well. And the second theme is this. The second theme is that God is going to put on display his character towards those who believe. God is going to show you his attributes and his character and his goal for those who love him and who believe in him. And so as we kind of wade into this story and kind of get immersed in it, I want you to imagine those are the two themes that are most prominent. There are other things addressed in the book, but, but these are the two most prominent themes. And, and, and here in chapter one, something very, very unique and interesting happens. And we're gonna begin, I'm gonna give you three things to write down. You should write down those two themes that God is going to 
prove the character of the righteous and God is going to prove his character towards the righteous. But you should also write three other things down. One is this, that, that there is a court in heaven. There's an actual courtroom in heaven. And you're gonna catch a glimpse of it. There's a divine revelation that's given to the author of this book, most of which, like I said, believe is Moses, that gives us an insight into a spiritual battle going on and a, a, uh, a spiritual court being held. And I wanna read it to you. Here's what it says in verse six. It says, one day the angels, we get an introduction of Job and then verse six, it says, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And then this is really fascinating, I think, because God is the one who interjects Job in this whole story. In the courtroom of heaven, God brings up Job and he says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Hey, you know what he's saying? Hey, hey Satan, as you were roaming the earth, did you notice, did you notice Job? And the reason he, he did it, I can almost perceive God doing it with a smile. You know why? Because God loved Job. God looked at Satan and he said, you know, there's people on earth who love me. That's what he was saying. There's people on earth who are faithful to me. Hey, Satan, as you were roaming, did you notice? Did you notice that even in all your attempts to disrupt what I'm doing, there are people who still love me. I think it was a message that God was sending to Satan. And he was saying to, and here's what it says. There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's the same as his introduction. And, and, and here's, what, here's what happens. It says in verse nine, does Job fear God for nothing, Satan said? Now, why would he say that? He goes on to explain it this way. Satan says, um, have you not put a hedge, of, uh, a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I've seen Job, big deal. You've been so good to him, there's no reason. He is privileged and honored and protected and, and taken care of in such a way that he doesn't love you for the right reason. He loves you because all you've ever done is bless him. You know what Satan is saying is, God, that's a sham. Your relationship with that guy, Job, is a sham. It is not forged by any kind of real love. It's only forged by what he can get from you. And because he get, you give to him so well, he loves you. Of course he loves you. There's this debate going on in the courtroom of heaven. And he says, you have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. He says in verse 11, but now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will curse you to your face. Here comes the accuser in the courtroom of heaven who looks at Job and says, Job is nothing. Job is nothing but a betrayer who would turn his back on you so fast if you took from him what you've given to him. And the Lord said to Satan, very well, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself to not lay a finger. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. It's a little bit frightening in one regard, isn't it? It's a little bit frightening to get an insight into the courtroom of heaven and realize that there is an accuser there. And you know what? He is confident. He is confident to no end. He can win this. He is so confident. And you know what? He's looking at your life. And I promise you this. There is too much evidence in God's word and in the courtrooms of heaven. There's too much evidence to convince me that this is actually happening in your life today. The accuser is looking at you and going, ha, you, are you kidding me? 
Him? Her? You, you think they love you? And the theme of this book, the theme of what God is trying to accomplish is to say, oh yes, they love me. And I will prove to you that the faithful, the faithfulness of the upright, faithfulness of the upright in me is going to be sustained by my faithfulness to them. And so this is when the second thing, first thing was you need to write down that there's a heavenly courtroom. There's a debate. There's an argument. There's a case being held against you and for you today in heaven's court. And, and, and the second thing is this, write this down. It is the struggle is real. It really is. The struggle is real. You know why? Because in the preceding, uh, or in the next few verses, what occurs is this. It takes four direct actions from Satan in really just one moment. Like, I, don't, I can't even put a time span on it. It doesn't even take a full day. We're talking less than a half a day. Four distinct actions on Satan's part in this one moment in Job's life and everything he has is taken from him. Everything, just the way it was described in the courtroom of heaven. He said to God, if you struck him and took away all that blessing, it's over. And God says, okay, I'll allow you to have that kind of authority and that kind of control over his life. You can't take his life, but you can take from his life everything he has. And Satan will always take a mile where he gets an inch and he comes in and he destroys everything in four distinct actions it's all gone to include Job's family, his children. And, and we didn't read about that, but he had seven children and they're all killed. And all the servants and all the flocks and all the wealth and all the things that measure his success and all the things that measure that God is blessing him, it's all removed in a moment. Four different messengers of death arrive in Job's life in that moment. Four people and every single one of them says, I was over here in the field and oh my goodness, this this group of people came in and brought the sword and they killed everyone and they rode off with your livestock. And then the next, and, and you know what every messenger says? And I survived to tell you about it. And then the next one comes and, and describes the next scene and then the next one and the next one and every one of them says, and I'm the only one, only four servants left out of everything he had only to do one thing, deliver a message of death and destruction. That's it. That's it. And you know what? The struggle is real. You know why? I want to give you some insight into the story that is um, very interesting to kind of grasp and hold on to. Job knows less. Job knows far less about why this is happening than you do. In fact, I would tell you that Job doesn't even know why it's happening. He doesn't get the insight of heaven's courtroom. In fact, if you go read the entire passage, many, many chapters, dozens of chapters long, you will understand and realize Job was never given the insight that you and I just received when we read those first few verses. He had no idea that who it was that was taking everything from him. He didn't know how, why, what for. He, he had no clue. In fact, he and his friends go on for several chapters after this. And you know what they all try to figure out? They try to fit this circumstance unforeseen into their theological box to understand why, and they can't figure it out. You know why? They don't have the insight that you and I have right now in this moment. They don't realize they don't realize there's been a courtroom decision. The courtroom decision is this. You're allowed to take all that Job has. He doesn't have that clarity. You do. And you know what? I'm willing to bet that in your life and in your unforeseen circumstance, you were just like Job. You have no idea what the secrets of heaven actually are. You have no idea what decisions have been made by God Almighty in the heavenly places. You do not know who has been accusing you or what you've been accused of. You don't know the angle. You don't know all the facets of the spiritual battle, but you sure do know what it feels like to be under attack. And that was the reality for Job. 
He had no other answer. He had lost it all. The third thing I want you to write down is the reactive response. There's something to learn in this story and it's found in these next few verses I wanna read to you. It says in verse 20, pay attention closely. It says, at this, Job, at the news of this death and destruction, Job gets up and tears his robe and shaves his head and he fell to the ground in, what's the word? Worship. He fell to the ground in worship. Worship, the reactive response to learn from is that one right there. He worshiped God. I'm come back to that in a moment. And he said this, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the Lord, may the name of the Lord be praised. That is the reactive response that God sovereignly knew would come from the mouth of Job. God knew. Satan was so confident. Think about this. Satan had convinced one third, one third of heaven's angels to rebel with him against God. He was confident. If I could do that, then I can turn the heart of Job against God. And God said, try me. Try me because God said, I have built a relationship with that man that is built on a character of faith in who I am. And that will be unshakable in this moment. And you and I have the evidence of it. Job didn't know the why, but he knew who had authority in his life ultimately. In fact, we're not reading it, but if you go into chapter two, Job kind of reiterates that with his own friends. And he says, what? Am I supposed to only bless God's name when he blesses me? Am I not, am I, am I not to bless God even when he brings suffering into my life? That is some perspective. And I tell you, if you can create some space in your mind and create some space in your own theology, you'll probably create a few more questions if you receive and you hold to the fact that suffering can be and probably will be a part of your life. But God will meet you in that place if you learn how to reactively respond in the right way. He worshiped God. He worshiped God. I think this is incredibly fascinating for the fact that the scriptures tell us that no weapon formed against us will prosper. There is a spiritual battle that is being waged and the scripture doesn't tell you that a weapon will not be formed against you. The scripture tells you that a weapon formed against you will not prosper. It doesn't say that you could protect every physical thing that has ever been a earthly blessing or representation of that in your life. It says that your soul, that your spirit, that your eternity cannot be touched. God said to Satan, you can have the temporal things, but just let me remind you, you can't have him. And the reason that Job responded to God was because his faith, his belief was in God and his behavior followed his belief, not the other way around. He didn't just behave his way into, well, I hope this works. No, he believed that God was for him. He believed that God was the provision over his life. He believed even in his loss that God was still in control. And his only response and the only thing he had left was his voice. And he used it to worship God. It is such a lesson to us. It is such a lesson to us that our reactive response can be pre-decided even when we don't know what's coming for us and coming against us. Our reactive response is to stop and to worship God, to worship God. It is your weapon in the face of an uncontrollable, unforeseen pain, suffering, an unpleasant circumstance. You know, it doesn't end there, but I would tell you this is if you don't learn how to, if you don't learn how to worship God, then the circumstances of your life potentially can overpower you and carry you away. I think that part of that is related to this and it's a deeper, it's a deeper study, but I think part of it is related to this 
the purpose for which Satan was created was not to bring death and destruction, but was to lead one third of heaven's angels in the continual, unending, eternal worship of the one who had created them. And he forfeited that. He laid it down. He said, I deserve some of the glory for which I was actually created in purpose to give. I deserve some of that. And when that happened, when it happened, he was removed from his post. He was removed from his position of purpose. He was punished forever and he was cast out of heaven and he was pushed aside. And God turned and created a humanity and put in their hands the weapon that Satan laid down. And he declared that if you will worship me, you will win this war in the spiritual. And that is where it begins. And can I tell you, it's where it ends. Everything starts in Jesus and everything will end in the praise of his name. Notice what God says about Job in that moment. Look with me, this last verse I wanna to read to you in the story. It says in verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Do you know what, you know what that is? It's, the, it's really just the beginning. And then we get into all the details and the chaoticness of this and the layers of it and the consequences of losing everything and the pain and the emotional turmoil that it brings. But before you get any farther into the story, it's as if God wanted you to know the end at the beginning. And he wanted you to know. And he wanted Satan to know. And he wanted the demons to know. And he wanted everybody to know that he remained righteous in the midst of this horrible, tragic, and awful moment. That Job actually remained sinless in his judgment about who God is. It doesn't say that Job was always a sinless person. It says in this moment, in all of this, in what God was trying to prove, God was right. God was right. You know what some of us should learn? We should learn this. We should stop spending our life trying to prove other people wrong and start like Job, proving God right with the way that we react and respond in the midst of things that are unfavorable to us. It doesn't matter who you prove wrong. It matters as if you can prove God right. And you have that opportunity and you have that chance. I think it's a remarkable that long after this, long after this, the brother of Jesus would write these words in the book of James chapter five. And he would say, he would say to us, as you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. You've heard that story. You heard it today. Maybe not the first time. You've heard of Job's perseverance, he would say, and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He's full of compassion and mercy. Do you know what that is? That is James' commentary on the story of Job. That is James saying to you and I that the entire message of the story was to demonstrate the compassion and the mercy of God. You just have to get below the surface to understand how that's true. You have to look beyond what he lost to see what he actually was gaining. You have to look deeper into the story and recognize, and Job gives you some insight to that because he responds with worship. And he says, below the surface of all of this that I'm experiencing, I am confident that God is compassionate and he's merciful. Here's how I would uh, maybe frame all this in for you is that Satan has pain for every one of you. Satan wants to destroy everything that you have. There is a real spiritual battle occurring over your life, over your existence, over your eternity. And God has for all who will believe compassion and mercy in the midst of that pain. Don't get it confused, church. Don't get it twisted. God is, not, God is not inflicting pain on your life. Satan is. God is faithful to use it to demonstrate his mercy over your life. 
That's what he wants. He's, perse- he's calling you to perseverance. So if it's not clear already, here's, here's the one thing I wanted to say to you today is that there are so many great things that you can do today that bring fulfillment, that bring health, that bring unity with God and unity with other people that mature your faith and that grow you that are really conscious decisions that you make to say yes to God. But there is also going to be a day in which you don't have as much freedom to choose in the moment, you will have to have chosen before the moment. You will have to have pre-decided, will I worship God the next time I don't have an answer? I don't know that today is gonna produce for you any resolution other than this, to take a step towards God and worship today and lift your heart to him no matter what you're facing or what you could be facing. I don't know that this, this message as your pastor has necessarily produced all kinds of blanks filled in for you about who God is and what you're facing. I just hope it fills in one blank, which is this. You need to worship God. You need to give him your voice, your heart, your life. It needs expressed no matter what the circumstances in the storm of your life looks like. And that's the invitation he's giving you to react well when you can't control it and to trust him, to trust him, to recognize he's not the source of your pain. He is the source of your mercy that you get to experience in this life. I wanna lead you in a time of prayer and I wanna ask you to stand to your feet and I wanna ask you to bow your heads and give everybody around you some, some moments to just contemplate and to think about this and hear the voice of God now. What is God saying to you in the midst of this this uh, story, the story of Job. What is he trying to say? Not just what Pastor Ryan is trying to inform you with, but, but what is God actually trying to communicate to you? He knows the details of your life. And I, I wanna first acknowledge this, that some of you in this room today, you don't have the confidence that you could respond and worship to God because you don't know him. And what I mean by that is that you don't have an, have an actual relationship with him. He is God, but he's not necessarily father God to you. But can I tell you something? He wants to be. He wants to be your father. He wants to be in relationship with you. In fact, if you, if you really get into the biggest picture of the story of Job, it is a foreshadow of what Jesus would ultimately do as the redeemer of our life. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I know, I want you to just think about this. I didn't read it to you, but I want to tell you the end of the story. The end of the story is once it's all completed and everything has passed, God comes alongside of Job and he demonstrates to Job the opposite of everything that Satan did to him. And he restores everything that he lost. And he doesn't just restore it, but he exponentially restores all that was lost. There might be some loss in your life, some things that you did not have control over that maybe at one point you even attributed to maybe God is against me. Maybe God is not for you, for you. But can I just tell you today that God is absolutely for you. He wants to come and walk alongside of you. He wants to grab your hand. He wants to put his arm around you. He wants to walk with you in this life and demonstrate to you how much provision of fulfillment, mercy, and compassion he has for what you've been through. And maybe today, you just need to settle with God this one thing. I want a relationship with you. I can't figure out all the answers in one moment, but I do want God. And if that's you today, I wanna encourage you to pray this prayer. Would you tell him, God, I need you. Today, I need you. I don't want you to just be God. I want you to be Father God. I want relationship with you that I can understand. I wanna have conversations with you. I wanna read your word and understand who you are so that I can understand more about who I am. I would encourage you to confess that you have a belief today that he can actually carry you through the things that you face in this life. Would you tell him that? God, I believe you can, you can sustain me. Would you tell him, I believe you can actually forgive me of the sin that's in my life, that you can reward me and restore me and repurpose my life. And from this point forward, from this moment on, I wanna learn what it means to walk with you. The scriptures tell us that if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and that he has the ability to reconnect us to our Father in heaven, it would happen, and that we would be saved from a life, a life that was purposeless, a life marked by sin, 
a life marked by regret, that it could be a life that is restored to hope. And so God, I pray for every person in this place today and all the people of our campuses, all the people online, everybody who's listening to a message like this today, that, that we would all unify around Jesus, that we would all unify around a hope that you've given us in him. He's purchased our salvation. I pray for every person in this room, every person listening, that you would speak in the midst of their pain and you would remind them you're not an afflictor of pain. You are a provider of peace. And I pray that, they, that your peace would be given now to people in pain, people in suffering, people who are walking through circumstances they never would have chosen for themselves. God, I pray you'd speak to them in this moment that you would raise our eyes towards heaven, that you would give the eyes of our heart clarity to see the possibilities and the opportunities that you have for our life that you're walking us into. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen.